Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to Property 2021 and Beyond. My name is Ashish Patani. I'm going to be one of your hosts uh, for the day today. And we're going to be looking at three different aspects of the property sector today. In the UK, around two thirds of households own the house that they live in, with around half of those still paying off a mortgage. The rest are in rented accommodation, either private or social rent. And clearly the housing market is closely linked to consumer spending. And the impact of COVID-19 has had a big impact on the sector and obviously the UK economy as a whole. Uh, so it's going to be a fascinating day to look at some of the prospects for the property sector in 2021 and beyond. Uh, and we're going to be looking at three aspects of the sector uh, in particular today. So this morning, we're going to start off looking at the residential sector. And we've got three exceptional speakers uh, who will be sharing the experiences for that. Then at 11.30, we're going to be looking at the buy-to-let investment uh, sector of the property market. And then at two o'clock, we're going to be looking at property development and bridging finance um, as, uh, aspects of the property sector. So it's going to be a, a sort of long day, but hopefully we're going to have breaks in the middle for coffee and rest um, for, and everybody uh, hopefully should get through. Um, we're going to try and make it as interactive as possible uh, this uh, session. Uh, we've got a great lineup of speakers who are going to be sharing their experiences of the sector. Um, so do uh, make the most of it. Do ask questions um, in the poll, uh, sorry, in the chat box or the Q&A box on uh, Zoom. So just a quick introduction of myself. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Ashish Patani. I'm a chartered accountant and director at Ash Linwood. Um, my background essentially started at uh, firms like PwC, where I used to do audit and assurance work for financial services. Um, doing audit work for hedge funds, private equity funds, venture capital funds. Uh, and then I moved on uh, to Citigroup in 2009, where I looked at fund services um, for EMEA, which is basically Europe, Middle East and North Africa. Uh, I mean, it, it was a global role and we had teams across the world from Singapore to Bahrain, uh, Luxembourg Island, New York and obviously UK. Um, so after quite a few years of employment, I decided to set up my own firm, uh, Ash Linwood. And what we do is we're a consultancy firm, but we're also a registered accountancy and tax firm. Therefore, we are able to provide accounting, tax, assurance uh, services, as well as business support, operational support, digital transformation projects, and consultancy uh, work for many of our clients in the banking and financial service sector, the charity sector, the SME sector, and private clients. And it's the latter um, private client sector, which over the last sort of year has led to loads and loads of queries on two particular areas. Uh, one has been property and the other one has been ESG investments. And, and just as a quick side note for ESG investments, which are basically investments based on environmental, social and governance criteria, we're gonna be doing a separate webinar for anybody who's interested in that. And we'll share some of those details on our website. But today, obviously our focus is on properties. And what has really led us here today is literally over the last years, we've started getting so many queries around sort of tax structures and uh, relating to properties. And then slowly and slowly, those queries started increasing in numbers and complexity. Uh, and many of the people started asking about, you know, um, property investment, sourcing, financing. So we basically decided to create an informal property group. Um, and this is what has really led us today because a group of uh, individuals from the group uh, came together to want to share their experiences uh, and insights of the property sector, um, which basically brought us to do today. Uh, and hopefully it's helpful to everybody uh, who is joining us today. Uh, before we introduce our first speaker, I would just like to say a quick uh, hello to Paranisha, who's going to be helping us in the background run today's uh, various sessions. Um, so, Bounty, if you maybe want to say a quick hello. Oh, thank you, Ashish. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome. So, my name is Bhavani Shah. I'm a policy advisor, policy advisor at HM Treasury. I too am in, interested in property and keen to learn more uh, from uh, today's webinar, and I hope all of you will find it informative and helpful too. I'm sure over the year and more, um, most of you have used Zoom uh, for webinars and meetings. And uh, just wanted to say that we wish for today to be an interactive session. And um, just in case you're not familiar with it, for you to ask, 
ask questions using the Q&A icon button on your screen at the bottom. You can also uh, use the, comment, uh, the chat box for any comments. And just a kind request, please just use the Q&A icon for questions so that we're able to uh, manage quite easy. Uh, we also uh, will try our best to answer any questions um, today. And if we can't, please do contact us offline. Ashish's contact details are displayed on the screen. We are also sharing our speakers' contact details too, in case you wanted to follow up with them directly. A recording of the webinar is available on our website in a few days, and a copy of the slides uh, will also be available to download after the event too. Thank you, and now back to Ashish. Uh, th thanks, uh, Barney. And I, I think uh, as you were speaking, you've answered one of the questions we've already received, which was, is there going to be a recording of the Zoom uh, session? So yes, there will be, and it'll be on our website. So that, that's great. Um, thank you. Um, before we start, um, uh, just an important um, disclaimer. Um, I'm sure everybody will understand um, and we always need to live, we live in a world of disclaimers. So um, basically the idea of today is to uh, share information um, and all our speakers are doing this on a voluntary basis and sharing their insights uh, about the property sector from their understanding uh, of their involvement in it. Uh, obviously everything we've tried to do and source the information uh, and reference it as accurately as possible, but obviously errors can happen. Uh, so just a quick disclaimer to that effect. Nothing that we're gonna be saying here today is meant to be any sort of financial or investment advice. And you should clearly get your own sort of independent assessment of it done with your um, professional advisors and make your own decision. We're here simply to share information in good faith and hopefully we, find, we hope that everybody finds the session uh, informative. Uh, so with that said, I want to get everybody to sort of start using the interactive function. And we've got a very quick poll for everyone. And hopefully you'll see the poll question um, online. Um, it's very simple. Here is a map of the UK, um, sorry, of London uh, boroughs, color coded for annual house price increases in 2020. Um, and the question that we have is, uh, which color represents uh, a negative house price change on the map? Is it blue, gray, orange, yellow, or white? So we're just gonna launch the first uh, poll. And hopefully everybody uh, watching will be able to see a poll question come on uh, their screens. And if you could simply just pick one of the colors um, so I'll just repeat it one more time, give everybody a few seconds to vote. Um, which color represents negative house price change on the map? Is it blue, gray, orange, yellow, or white? Uh, and this is based on the changes which were uh, recorded in 2020 and is per the information from the National uh, Statistical uh, Office of National Statistics. So. Uh, quite a few of you have already voted, which is great. Um, I'll just give everybody a few more seconds um, to vote, um, and then we will reveal what the answer is. So, right, a few more seconds, maybe three, two, one. Thank you so much. Right, um, just going to share the... Share the results. Um, again, hopefully everybody is watching this, uh, the results on the screen. So um, majority uh, of the attendees uh, thought um, blue uh, was the ones with negative uh, growth, um, followed by yellow at 23% and then gray uh, at 20%. So thank you, thank you everybody for participating in the Poll. Uh, everybody thought 35% thought it was blue. Um, I'm just gonna remove. So the the overall answer should have been gray. Um, so the ones which are marked in gray, three boroughs, 
uh, showed negative uh, house price growth uh, last year, according to the information from the ONS. Uh, all other areas showed uh, moderate positive um, uh, growth in house prices. Uh, so it's effectively, we'd be looking at the boroughs of um, um, Barnet, Barking and uh, West, uh, Westminster. Um, which showed a negative uh, growth rate. And that was just a little poll question just to get everybody um, using the poll buttons. So what we want to go now do is just have a very quick introduction to the topic of residential sector. Uh, again, give me on this, bringing on the next slide. Um, so obviously there's been quite a lot of talk recently of the housing market cooling. And in fact, the housing price index, which was published by Halifax on 5th of January, uh, sorry, 5th of February, uh, stated house prices fall slightly in January with early uh, signs the market is starting to cool. Clearly, uh, COVID has a huge impact on the sector and there's going to be a huge impact short term. However, we do need to consider some key fundamentals for the residential sector uh, when we take this information into account. The government's own current estimate stands at something like 345,000 new homes are required in uh, England alone per year to meet demand. However, something like 244,000 new housing stock was actually created in the year 2019 to 2020. So there's effectively 100,000 uh, housing shortage. And this has been a trend for a number of years. When you factor in that the UK population has been steadily increasing for many years uh, and is currently shy of 70 million, we do need to take into account the demand for a residential housing. Together, we also need to consider the growing population and the type of housing which is required, more single and two occupancy housing as opposed to large family homes. And furthermore, there's also a shortage for accessible housing Something like one in five adults over the age of 65 essentially need some sort of assistance on a daily basis. And yet, when we look at the new houses which are being built, only one in 15 are actually accessible and cater for the elderly uh, demography. And there is also an estimate uh, that something like 400,000 wheelchair users are actually currently living in housing, which is not adapted or for easy accessibility for them. So there's clearly lots of different opportunities and uh, options within the residential housing uh, sector. Furthermore, with interest rates at a historic low, house prices have tended to be at historic highs. And this trend is likely to continue, uh, continue because it's unlikely that we're going to be seeing any dramatic increase in interest rates anytime uh, soon. If anything, inflation is likely to rise as economic policies are designed essentially to stimulate the post-COVID uh, recovery in the coming years. There's also a gap uh, in sort of how the UK average house prices have performed compared to London. And the gap has been increasing. And you can see on the screen clearly that uh, London prices have been uh, increasing uh, quite significantly in terms of average prices compared to the rest of the UK. So there is likely to be some sort of rebalancing uh, between London and the rest of the UK, uh, especially nowadays when a lot of people are going outside into the countryside following the COVID uh, pandemic and readjusting to the new normal, where essentially a lot of people are working from home. And even when things do start opening up, it's very likely that most people will be working from home for at least a few days of the week, uh, if not the whole week. Um, and therefore, there's going to be more demand for different types of housing with a bit more space at home for work as well. And I'm sure everybody at, uh, watching has been adjusting to working from home over the last year and can uh, sort of understand the consequences which are happening. And in fact, there was a recent study which showed that actually London is going to lose something like 300,000 people because simply they're going to be moving out of London. And for the first time since 1988, that the London population is actually going to come uh, down, uh, whereas it's been increasing steadily over the last few years. So if we take a look at London itself, um, and this is again information that we've got from the planning portal from uh, the mayor of London, office, uh, it shows huge areas of brownfield sites which have actually been identified for housing development. Um, and there's obviously a talk in recent times of high streets being allowed to be used for rest, some sort of residential developments. So clearly there's going to be new housing stock coming onto the market. 
And again, together with major infrastructure projects, I mean, you've got projects in um, near East London, uh, where you're looking at the London Resort, which is likely to open up in 2029. Uh, you also have Heathrow expansion in the West, uh, and you also have uh, infrastructure projects like Crossrail or the Elizabeth Line connecting London East to West, as well as Crossrail 2, which is going to be connecting London North to South. So there's clearly a lot of things happening, which is going to be uh, joining different parts of the city and different parts of the country, in fact, through HS2 um, high-speed railway networks and connecting different city hubs together. So as you can imagine, there is a lot of things going on. Uh, we're only touching upon a Sorry, we're only touching upon a very high level highlight um, of these uh, factors to consider uh, when we look at the residential market. Uh, so clearly a growing population means that there is going to be more demand for housing, low interest rates coupled with midterm slight increases in inflation means that house prices are likely to steadily increase. Uh, demand for affordable and accessible homes also means that there is a bank of brownfield sites which are ripe for development if uh, you're willing to do your research in identifying the right opportunities. So it's with great pleasure that I want to now introduce on screen uh, Nick and Rupal uh, from London Mortgage uh, Solutions. Uh, so let me just um, bring them on screen. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll be able to see uh, Nick and Rupal on screen. Uh, just as a quick introduction, uh, Nick has uh, many years, uh, I think, if, I, if I'm not giving away your age, but many years, <laughs> like more than a decade of uh, experience in um, uh, residential and buy-to-let uh, mortgages. He set up London Mortgage Solutions uh, as his current business, and Rupal is has joined him recently. And Rupal herself has many years of experience in the mortgage sector, having previously worked for global investment houses uh, such as Goldman Sachs, uh, as well as uh, organizations like T-Mobile. So I'm not going to say any more than that. I want to hand over to you guys now. So uh, Nick and Rupal, over to you guys. Thank you, Ashish. And Good morning to everybody. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. So hopefully um, everyone should be able to um, see this presentation and hear me um, fine. So as Ashish mentioned, yes, we are talking about property in 2021 and beyond. And um, our focus this morning will be on a uh, residential market, um, which also includes some of the uh, buy to let areas as well. Um, as a shush, very kindly introduce myself. My name is Nick Mayer from London Mortgage Solutions and I am here with a new joiner, Rupal, um, who has lots of experience in the mortgage industry. Um, and we'll now go through our presentation. Um, again, as Ashish mentioned about this particular disclaimer, I won't go over it again um, because Ashish already has done so. So what we want to talk about, I'll let Rupal actually talk about this particular slide. Um, Rupal, are you there? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Ashish, Bhavani and Nick. Um, yeah, nice to be here and share our own thoughts on this. Um, so before we start, and just to make sure to see whether your guys are all awake, uh, I have a poll question for you. Um, so how many of you are first time buyers or home movers in the next few months? Uh, so that's a question. How many of you are first time buyers or looking to buy your first property or looking to move, move in the next 12 months? Nick, I'm just gonna um, uh, stop your share and then I can launch the poll if you don't mind. Yeah. Okay, no problem at all. Yeah. Slide. So we've got um, a poll question, hopefully which should come up. It says, uh, how, uh, how would you best describe yourself? Uh, are you a first time buyer, a potential home mover in the next 12 months, a property investor or other? As, and we'll just give everybody a few minutes uh, to, oh, sorry, a few seconds to press the right button or choice. Uh, so again, how would you best describe yourself? First time buyer, uh, potential house mover 12 to in the next 12 months, property investor or other? 
Okay, uh, I think most of you have uh, voted. Um, just give it a few more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Thank you so much for participating in that. Um, and I'll just share the results so our panel can see it as well. Um, so majority of them, uh, majority of people listening today are 56% are property invest investors. Uh, and then uh, first time buyers, 17%, uh, potential movers, 8%. Thank you for that. And we have one other poll uh, question, which is a follow up to this. So uh, let me just launch, uh, launch that poll as well. So th this one is looking at what is the best structure that would describe yourself? Are you a, a sole trader, employee, company owner or other? So what perspective are you looking at it from? Are you looking at it as an individual, a sole trader, employee, uh, company owner? Because obviously in terms of property structuring investment, th this could have an impact. So again, th thank you so much for everybody who's participating. Um, one more time, what structure best describes you? Sole trader, employee, company owner, or other? And if you've chosen other, then please feel free to comment in the chat box um, what you mean what you mean by that. So it just gives our panelists a bit of an idea um, and helps them to cover the material appropriately. Okay, so uh, a few more seconds. Three, two, one. Thank you. And again, I'll just share the results. Um, so majority listening in are employees, 39%. Uh, then company owners, 29%, and sole traders, 19%. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, hopefully, um, that, that, hopefully Nick, Nick and uh, Ripple, that's given you an idea. So Nick, if you want to share your screen again now, that would be great. Sure. Thank you. And thank you all for participating. That actually gives us a better idea as to um, uh, who we need or what kind of information we need to uh, provide our listeners this morning as well. So um, over to RuPaul regarding the current status uh, and the end of the stamp duty holiday. Yeah, so thank you, Nick. Um, so, you know, we all know that uh, Rishi Sunak last year announced a stamp duty holiday or reprieve uh, last summer. Now that holiday or relief is coming to the end next, at the end of next month on March 31st. And what we have seen that, what, what that has done in terms of to the property market from, I guess, Q3 2020 was, we've seen a significant increase in demand for property and property purchases. So what does that actually mean? What that means was first time buyers, home movers, uh, buy to let investors actually were bringing forward their purchases to benefit from this relief. Typically, just to give an example, a first time buyer buying a 400,000 pound property, uh, would actually make savings of, of around about £5,000, whereas a buy-to-let investor or someone buying a second property would actually benefit by about £10,000 on that same property price. So there were huge benefits in buying during this stamp duty holiday. What we also saw was the stock levels go up, so the market became very, very buoyant, and in fact, it kind of reached that pre-EU referendum level up in 2016, and house prices as you can imagine, went up by 5.4% from a year ago. So we've actually seen demand go up, price go up. And what we've also seen um, actually from December is that there's been a slight cooling. So by 0.3% kind of on a month on month basis. It's actually not surprising to see this cooling, uh, although we believe that this is actually due to a tapering of demand and almost in line with the stamp duty holiday coming to an end next month. So typically when you're looking to buy a house, it takes a few months. So for, for property purchases to complete by the end of next month, we'd expect this cooling by December 2021, going to January 2020, uh, well, going to uh, last month as well. Thank you, RuPaul. So what's happened over the course of 2020? Well, as we know, the pandemic has literally impacted um, everybody globally. Um, and many of 
uh, well, many sectors within the UK have, have been affected um, more than others. Um, very similar to hospitality, unfortunately, has, has been a, a massive industry that's been impacted along with the travel as well. Um, what does this mean to those particular individuals looking to get onto the property ladder or, or to buy more clearly? Um, without the income, they're unable to obviously get the lending required um, from, from the lenders. Um, and also with furlough, um, obviously, as we know, many people have been, have been furloughed in, in for 2020, uh, which has impacted lenders because they weren't lending to people that um, have been furloughed. So naturally, this will lead to a slower market. Um, but with the hope of the vaccine rollout, which has, in my opinion, been a, a great success, if I'm completely honest, um, I think that uh, the light at the end of the tunnel is actually near us now. Um, and with that being said, um, hopefully we will start to see the market and the economy opening up in the next few months. Over the last 12 months or so, or 11 months or so, um, Home movers or first time buyers have potentially saved um, lots of money because they've been working from home. So they've saved on travel costs to and from work, and obviously not really having the luxury to go away on holiday. Um, so they obviously saved some money there. So hopefully that would actually enable buyers um, to invest that money um, into, into their next home if they're looking to upsize or potentially seek to buy an investment property. Um, now, there's a lot of uh, rumours, if you like, about the budget um, and what's going to happen with stamp duty. Um, I, in my opinion, it's, it's impossible to say what's going to happen with stamp duty. Um, we all hope that potentially it will get extended. Um, there is talk of, again, rumours um, of a six-week extension to allow those that are currently in a chain to complete and to actually benefit from the saving. Um, but there's also talk um, that it may extend for a further six months. Um, so again, all rumours, and it's a case of just sitting tight and um, waiting to see. The government have clearly lost, I think I read an article last week where the government lost um, about £500 million worth of revenue from the uh, stamp duty holiday. So it'll be interesting to see if they do extend it, and if so, for how long. Um, but whatever happens, we do expect the residential market to remain buoyant with um, low interest rates. And that has been the case for quite some time now. And again, um, with lots of individuals saving money over the last 12 months, um, I think people will still uh, be in a position to buy or invest in property. Um, and hopefully we'll continue to see a steady increase in house prices in 2021. Right, this actually, the, so the home ownership slide is quite an interesting one. Um, we actually saw in 2020, home ownership um, increased, so to a total of 64.6% .6 in the whole of the UK. And what that actually means is this is the third year in a row we've seen this increase um, and numerically so we're looking at about 15.4 million households who are owners with or without a mortgage. Um, what does this actually mean? So it means that we're steadily moving away from renting. Um, the main kind of age group of buyers which we're seeing is between the age group of 25 and 44 I, the government schemes that have actually been launched, like help to buy, shared ownership, are playing a huge part in giving, I think, first-time buyers the opportunity to get on the property market with lower deposits. So that's actually seeing the increase in home, home ownership. Um, interestingly, uh, even though you know England generally has seen the home ownership rates go up, London as a sector has actually has got the lowest home ownership of 50%. So the renting sector is a lot higher. And that primarily is, I guess, down to the fact that London is so much more expensive to buy in compared to the rest of the country. But on, on, on the whole, 
we've seen southeast uh, in the southeast home ownership also go up as well. Yeah, and I think on the back of that, um, you know, we have seen mortgage approval mortgage approvals increase, um, and no doubt, you know, as you can see from from the red line um, here on the chart that since August last year, since the stamp duty announcement, um, there's been a significant uh, increase, um, which has uh, ex exceeded 2019. Um, House prices growth ended in 2020 on a six year high, despite the economy shrinking by 10%. Um, and again, in 2021, housing market act activity outlook remains fairly buoyant, despite the end of the stamp duty coming up in about five weeks time. So the residential overview, if you like. Um, what we've seen over the last six months um, is that lenders want to lend. It's as simple as that. Um, at the beginning of the lockdown, we saw a lot of lenders um, not want to go over 80, 85% loan to value. Um, however, over the last few months, especially since uh, end of November, beginning of December, some of the lenders came back to the 90% loan to value market. And that was followed by uh, more high street lenders coming back to 90% uh, in January. So lenders want to lend. They obviously need to ensure that money is um, circulating in, in the economy. Um, so hopefully, fingers crossed, that trend will continue um, into 2021. We will go on to the employed and self-employed mortgages category in the next few slides. I won't expand on that just yet. Um, but while the number of new deals has risen, rates in terms of different categories for borrowers vary. Um, that being said is that those that want to get onto the property ladder um, and only have a 10% deposit are having to pay a short term, uh, if you like, because I think rates are around three and a half percent. So it's a short term sacrifice for a long term gain for those that want to get onto the property ladder. Um, but hopefully, um, you know, that will enable people to, to obviously make their dream come true and start to go onto the property ladder. Okay. So here, I guess we'll discuss kind of more about the employed section where residential mortgages are concerned. So employed borrowers are generally perceived as low risk by lenders. Um, the way they, they, they calculate their, their income is based on your gross annual salary, any other income that you've got in terms of uh, bonus, uh, commission, overtime, and it's generally whatever's on your payslip and your P60s. When the lockdown started uh, in end of March last year, what we saw by July 2020 was, you know, with everything shutting down, the number of 90% deals dropped significantly to about 70. However, as a pandemic has gone on and lockdown easing, although we were actually now in a lockdown, but it's not as bad as it was uh, in spring last year, we're seeing lenders returning and we've got now about 248 deals at 90% loan to value, which is huge because that just goes to show that lenders do want to lend. And, you know, uh, in terms of uh, employed clients, you know, you're considered to be quite a safe option. What has kind of changed things is what if you're on furlough. So initially, if you are on furlough, um, lenders were reluctant to lend to you because they didn't know where this pandemic was heading in terms of industries and sectors. What we've seen recently is uh, furloughed applicants uh, do have lending options. So if you've been furloughed and you're currently receiving, you know, 80% of your income whilst being on furlough, there are definitely options out there for you to borrow at 80%. And if your employer is topping up your salary to get you up to that 100%, there are still options out there for you get, get getting up to 100% borrowing. Now, what lenders like to see is, uh, I guess, a confirmation from their employers to say, look, that the employees are returning back to work once all this is eased and they're quite happy with that sort of uh, confirmation. So, you know, it's all positive in terms of what lenders wish to do, 
and it's a case of just making sure we approach the right lender in terms of your situations and circumstance. Now, uh, if you're looking at loan to value, Nick mentioned about the fact that if you've got a 10% deposit, rates are you know about three and a half percent upwards, but at least that gets you on that property market and on that property ladder. Uh, but if you're looking to borrow at about 60%, rates are very, very cheap at 1.22% and at 75% at 1.44%. And typically lenders are offering, if you know, up to a 40 year term, depending on your age. So it's all good. And what we're, what we like to, we're likely to see is with the base rate being at 0.1%, 0.1%, um, this is gonna continue in the short to medium term. And as Ashish mentioned, you know, it, it kind of comes down to inflationary measures, you know, what, what that's gonna happen over the next uh, year or two. Just going over to the self-employed um, individuals now. Uh, yeah, we have approximately 5 million self-employed people here in the UK. Um, self-employed applicants have always been scrutinized that little bit more uh, when it comes to lenders um, and their mortgage applications. So typically speaking, um, you know, pre-COVID, it was always, you know, where's your tax calculation? Let's look at your salary and dividends and see See how much you've actually um, withdrawn for yourself over the last two years. Um, but there are some other lenders now that will look at salary and net profit. So for those that you know have a low salary and only take the dividends that's required for uh, your bills and general expenditure, those that retain the profit within the business can really benefit from um, not paying a huge amount of tax, and we, you know, and there are lenders that uh, that will definitely look at salary net profit and not so much salary and dividends. Um, since COVID, um, self-employed individuals, yes, are being scrutinised that uh, a little bit more. Um, not only are they looking for the previous two or three years worth of accounts, but now they're also requesting. Um, three months business bank statements and that's really just to see you know the activity um, over over recent months um, during the pandemic and obviously to see you know how your business is actually operating um, before actually making any formal lending decision um, and again if those that have taken bounce back loans or CVs etc those are being judged um, however there are some lenders that are still willing to lend to individuals that have taken out uh, government support, financial support from a bounce back loan um, or people. So if you do have any concerns, um, what I would say is, is to get in contact and we can certainly um, explore that for you in a bit more detail. But overall, self-employed individuals um, are still in a position to lend and get a mortgage, um, but just be aware that there is that little bit of extra scrutiny um, at this present moment. So if you're in this position where you've currently got a mortgage um, and your product is coming to an end, what we've seen over the last few months is we've seen plenty of applications from client, you know, where, where they're in that situation. So normally you'd come to us about three or four months before your current products coming to an end. And we all know how the pandemic has affected revenue, income, profitability. And once I guess we assess everything, a remortgage may not be uh, the best option for you because you, know, you cannot show that consistent flow of income. So what we would tend to do is obviously look at everything for you. And you know if the best option is then for you to do a product transfer and move you to a competitive deal with your existing lender, that's the option we would offer for you. It would actually be a huge saving in terms of time. And you know it kind of ensures you get the best options available to you. When it comes to... Um banks, they typically want to look at income multiples. Um, and generally speaking, um, 
Inter multiples have always been around the 4.75 times mark. Um, however, for those that are in particular professions, such as dentists, doctors, accountants, lawyers, can actually get five times or even five and a half times your income. So um, it's worthwhile you know, exploring uh, those options for those that are in those particular industries. Um, how even for those that are uh, self-employed, as I mentioned, last but two years salary net profit, um, again, we can certainly explore that. But the main purpose is, is that lenders want to lend. We haven't really seen income multiples drop to like, let's say four times your income. Um, they have been there or thereabouts pre-COVID um, and, they, and they still remain um, within that kind of income multiple bracket um, around 4.75 to, to potentially five times or even five and a half times your income. So going back to kind of what Ashish was talking about, you know, in the beginning, um, you know, what is a, what is in a buyer's thought process in 2021? You know, whether you're um, a first time buyer or a home mover, so, you know, 2020 has, and the pandemic has really altered the way we work and, you know, in a way, the way we think, you know, going ahead. Uh, working from home has obviously become a new normal. And as Ashish mentioned, you know, when things do go back to a normal, you know, there'll be probably either some people working from home all the time, will be a part in part or people returning back. So it won't be the same as it was pretty much 2020. And space has been a real key in terms of what, uh, you know, applicants want when they're now, you know, open to working from home. Larger houses, living spaces. So even where I've had inquiries where people would have ordinarily been happy with a one bed flat, at, they actually now want a two bed flat or a two bed house. They want that extra room or they want guard, a garden at the back just, in, you know, just because they're spending so much more time at home. Um, even locations, location choices are changing. So people are going more outwards, you know, wanting more greenery. And as long as they're good transport links, you know, in terms of where they travel to or work to, you know, that has been a huge driving factor. You know, we've had a lot of remortgage clients come back and want wanting capital raising uh, for home improvements. So conversion of garage to offices, uh, you know, building an office at the back of the garden, and you know, seeing that sort of uh, uh, kind of demand for it, and lenders are more than happy to actually consider lending on that basis. So, the general feeling is there is a surge in first-time buyers or home movers wanting to leave that concrete jungle for more space, um, and it's just the way you know. I guess the new world is going to work. I think just to kind of recap on a couple of bits in, throughout this kind of presentation is that, yes, we all know what well, we all now should know that lenders want to lend. Um, I think the poll had lots of vital investors here that are tuned in. So the good news is, is that um, for those that only, you know, have 20, 25% deposit, again, we can certainly expose options. Um, a lot of buy to let lenders have come up to 80% LTV now, which is also good news. For those investors, um, as we've also mentioned, that um, rates are are currently low, and they as they have been, um, and more importantly, service levels. Service levels had a huge impact last year. Um, you know, a standard mortgage application from application to offer would only take about uh, ten to fourteen days, um, but during the pandemic, it was taking lenders four to five weeks essentially um, to review the application and then to make a decision because they're getting used to from working from home. But um, now that they have been working from home for a number of months, uh, what we have seen is that lender service levels have resumed back to normal, if you like. Um, so on average now, it's only taking lenders for two weeks to actually make a decision um, on your application. So um, it's good to see that lenders have adapted um working from from home essentially so 
I've actually, well, back on the back of that poll question that Ashish posted on how many of you, what type of uh, buyers are you? Uh, quite a lot of you are kind of buy to let or investors. So I thought it'd be really important that we actually can go through this slide just to kind of get an understanding of what a buy to let kind of property in, investment uh, involves. What is it from a mortgage point of view and, and how you can get um, the type of lending. So the types of landlords that uh, lenders consider are, you know, firstly, you can have a first time buyer, first time landlord. So you could be living at home with family. And if you're looking to buy your first investment property, um, you know, there are lenders willing to consider you having no property experience. You, we have something called accidental landlords. So these are typically landlords who would have inherited property and are looking to rent this out and get a mortgage. Um, you've got experienced and seasoned landlords or portfolio landlords. Now, these are typically uh, those landlords that own four or more mortgaged buy-to-let properties. So, um, you know, there's a vast choice dip available depending on your situation and circumstance. And, you know, as we mentioned before, lenders are looking to lend and are willing to lend. In terms of where the deposit level is, where um, uh, buy to let uh, lenders want to lend at, so 80% uh, lending is an option. Um, I would say there's plenty more options at 75% borrowing, so 25% deposit. Um, so you know you you get more favorability in terms of rates um, and also choice of lenders. So how how do lenders lend on a buy to let mortgage? So uh, generally speaking, uh, the way they look at it is they look to see what rent you're going to receive on that property you're looking to buy. They use something called the interest coverage ratio. And typically, so all they want to do is to make sure that your rent adequately covers your mortgage payments. So typically at 125% for um, a lower rate taxpayers, and 145% at higher rate taxpayers. And this is literally in line with what Sai will discuss, you know, in the next presentation of how, you know, you're not getting mortgage interest rate relief, you know, going forward. Just to mention here, so we've seen a lot of uh, investors coming in and wanting to buy in a limited company, uh, a special purchase vehicle. This is very, very common now compared to where it was three or four years ago. So plenty of options in terms of lenders. And the good news is they're actually lending at the lower tax rate of 125%. So you will be getting a, a, a higher leverage as opposed to buying in a personal name and being in a higher rate tax band. Repayment type, so options of capital and interest um, and interest only. Um, you can, you know, most what we find is 90, 95% of our kind of applicants go for the interest only option. They wish to maximize on the income they're receiving uh, purely because they're probably looking to then save up and buy, you know, another property. And, you know, if it's an investment property, you know, they're quite happy to just earn the income. The term, so, you know, you know, depending on which lender you go to, you can get, get lending up to the age of 80. So, you can be um, kind of 70, 79 at the point of application, or you can have a max term of 35 years. So you could have a term taking you um, to the age of 100 years plus. So again, there are, there are plenty of options there. Now, the types of ownership. So, you know, you can either buy in personal names, so you might already have properties that are in personal names um, and buy in limited companies. Rates differ. So uh, the rate differential typically between buying a personal name and a limited company for a like to like transaction is about 1% more expensive on the limited company, purely because a limited company is considered to be a semi-commercial investment, hence the rates reflect that. Um, so that's something you need to bear in mind. Uh, portfolio landlords, so again, as I mentioned, these are uh, uh, property kind of owners who own four or more uh, buy-to-let mortgage properties. How lenders class uh, or assess them is, is quite vast. So you have some lenders who look at your whole portfolio and lend you up to a certain loan to value based on the whole portfolio, or you have lenders who will not stress test at all and will look at the properties 
that you're looking to apply for and just lend you on that basis. So it's, it's very much a case of there's plenty of options and depending on what you want to do, we can go to the right lender. Um, we have also got access to a specialist buy to let lenders. So what they tend to do is where your rental income falls short, um, they give you the opportunity to borrow more. And the opportunity cost here is you need to fix your product for five years as a minimum and the rates are higher. Um, they stress it at a more generous level, but again, you're paying you know, in terms of higher interest co cost and fixing it for a longer period of time. So that, that, that as an option is there. In terms of minimum income, so I have a lot of clients who are asset rich, uh, cash poor, as I call them. So on their tax return, you might see you know, them declaring 8,000 pounds as income. Uh, there are lenders who will want to see a minimum of 25,000 and some do not have a minimum income. So that's, that's really, again, a, a, you know, you know, again, opportunity to, to approach different lenders depending on your requirements. We also have something called top slicing. So let's say you've got plenty of income in what you do as your main profession, but the rental doesn't stretch as far. Lenders are willing to use your um, extra disposable income to try and get you that leverage that you need. So, you know, as we said before, lenders really, really want to lend. One of the things we always say to clients who are property investors is that, you know, what are the costs you need to consider when you're buying? Uh, or remortgaging, their legals, again, the stamp duty implications, valuation and arrangement fees that, char that lenders charge, which can be up to what 2%. However, these can be added to the loan. And what we've seen lenders come back with into the market is what we call a refurbishment buy to let product. So you might go and see a property that you like, but it needs work. The lender gives you that option of having bridging finance with them. So you can buy that property at an auction and then have that exit product agreed onto a long-term buy-to-let mortgage with them once the works have been completed. So there are options out there for that option too. So, you know, there is, it depends, what we say is depending, depending on what you want to do, we can go to uh, the right buy-to-let lender for you. Yeah, and I think it's also worth pointing out as well that, um, you know, we also do assist clients with bridging finance as well. Um, and there are bridging finance companies that will um, also give you the funding for cosmetic work. So you're actually not having to fork out or actually use your own cash to actually um, carry out those works. As long as there's no extension work or anything and it's just internal cosmetic work, um, we do have bridging finance companies that will actually um, give you that extra funding um, as well. We have spoke a lot about Obviously, mortgages, residential, buy to let, and obviously um, the amount of debt essentially that one has. Um, but I think it's also good to raise some awareness um, for life insurance. Um, unfortunately, we've seen um, over 100,000 people sadly lose their life due to the pandemic here in the UK. Um, and I think it really kind of stresses the importance to really have some form of life insurance in place to protect you and your family. Um, I always recommend life insurance as a bare minimum because it literally for cheapest chips, you know, for those that really want to explore this option on average, you, you know, you're paying about 18 to 20 pounds a month, essentially to, you know, to cover you for three to 400,000 pounds. Yes, it's obviously dependent on uh, medical history and medical questions, um, but life insurance um, is cheap, and I would highly recommend that everyone um, explores explores this. Critical illness and income protection again are other areas of insurance. Um, it kind of speaks for itself. We're statistically we're more likely to suffer a critical illness than we are death during the mortgage term. Um, which is why the critical illness is actually more expensive. Um, but again, it, it's about ensuring that you're protected um, and, and your family are obviously well looked after. Um, so again, you know, we, we can offer um, life insurance um, as well to anyone that requires it. Um, 
I think that's it from us. Um, RuPaul, I think yeah. is there anything further which you wish to add? No, no, no. Um, I guess I'm just ready for the questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nick and uh, RuPaul. Um, yes, we do have quite a few questions come through. Um, but what I want to do is um, I want to bring on board um, Sahil uh, Shah um, from a tax consideration point of view, because uh, quite a few questions may be already answered through Sahil's uh, presentation, and then we'll uh, take um, remaining questions after that. So just want to introduce very quickly uh, Sahil. Um, he's a uh, charter tax advisor uh, with, again, many years of experience um, his uh, specialty also includes global mo uh, mobility space, focusing on taxes for individuals, um, especially in different uh, jurisdictions, um, UK as well as uh, outside of the UK. So Sahil, can I uh, uh, request you to come on screen? Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, please go. Ahead. Okay, great, thanks. Um, let me just uh, adjust the video. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Um, um, is that showing up as required? Yeah, that, that, that's fine. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so, like Ash has said, I've, I'm a chartered tax advisor. I've been uh, working in the tax space for about nine years. Uh, my experience is a mixture of uh, mid tier and big four uh, tax practices. Um, what I wanted to uh, give everyone some guidance on is the tax implications that um, arise out of um, investing in property. And um, like with uh, the disclaimer earlier, um, be aware what, what, we're, what I'm presenting is for information purposes, but for specific situations, it's always worth getting specific advice um, as everyone's um, specific scenarios are different. Um, okay. Um, so one of the um, questions which um, gets raised a lot whenever anyone's looking to um, buy property is um, what ta what are the tax considerations um, that I need to be aware of? And often people are quite um, afraid of approaching this topic because it um, it's portrayed as quite complex. Um, what I've drawn here is a table to help simplify um, that understanding and give people a very structured way of understanding which parts of our uh, tax legislation become relevant at different parts of the property ownership life cycle. Uh, so the life cycle here is uh, broken into three parts. Um, so purchase or acquisition, um, that's the first thing you do before um, uh, ownership becomes relevant. Um, and then lastly, um, sale or disposal. Uh, and you can see I've um, listed um, five different parts of the UK tax regime uh, vertically on this table. And where you see a cross in the box, that's to indicate uh, which element of the tax legislation becomes relevant at that part of the property ownership life cycle. So uh, the first one is uh, purchase. And um, many of you will know that's where stamp duty land tax becomes relevant. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail in a few minutes on that. Um, later on, um, I'll go into the details of what happens during ownership. Um, so discuss the implications from an income tax and corporation tax point of view. Uh, and lastly, um, on sale and disposal, I'll give some information on capital gains tax and inheritance tax. Um, okay. Um, so what what is stamp duty and land tax? Um, it's a tax levied um, whenever there's a purchase of either freehold property, uh, new or existing leasehold, or um, a land transfer in exchange for payment or consideration. Um, so whenever you're buying um, property, either for residential or for investment purposes, uh, it tends to be caught within this regime. And uh, SDLT um, becomes payable uh, when the total payment or consideration is above the SDLT threshold. Um, so the table in the bottom half of the slide uh, shows you what the SDLT rates uh, were in place up until June last year. 
and likely what they will revert to after the current stamp duty land tax um, relief ends. Um, and the, uh, ju yeah, just to uh, make everyone aware, the um, current uh, r relief on the SDLT regime um, gives people relief on their first purchase for a residential property. Um, the, the SDLT th threshold was raised to £500,000, um, but that's coming to an end on 31st of March. Um, from uh, 1st of April onward, um, unless we hear any different from the Chancellor, then um, the SDLT threshold would uh, likely revert back to um, £125,000. Um, one of the questions which gets asked um, a lot is, is the SDLT regime a um, marginal regime or is it all or nothing? Um, the answer to that is that it's um, uh, marginal. Um, so what that means is if you have a um, transaction where you're paying uh, £500,000 for a property, um, the first £125,000 is um, charged at zero uh, percent um, and then the other marginal rates kick in at, at the other um, thresholds and bands. Um, so that's a brief overview of um, stamp duty land tax. Um, the other question which often gets raised is uh, what's going to happen after the um, current holiday? Um, is it going to be extended? And like um, was de um, described in the um, previous presentation uh, we, we honestly don't know um, any anything any answer is um, would probably be a, a guess um, and for certainty we just have, just have to wait for to see what answers come from the Chancellor um, for, for any new announcements on that um, On this, I've listed a few things to remember, um, which sometimes get forgotten um, when SDLT is um, a topical issue. Um, and the, t the two points here which are worth reminding is that SDLT um, is uh, reportable and payable within 14 days of completion. Um, now that word completion is quite important because uh, it's distinguished from exchange. Um, when you purchase a property, there's often a point in time where you exchange, but completion can follow a few days, weeks, or months later. Um, SDLT is um, all um, pinned to the completion date. That's the tax point. And because the 14-day window is, is relatively narrow, um, what buyers are often advised to do is be aware of cash flow. Um, uh, it's it's worth taking into consideration the fact that you'll have to pay out a large amount of SDLT in a short space of time right at the beginning of your ownership life cycle. Um, and the other thing to remember, um, which um, people often forget because it becomes relevant much later on, but SDLT costs are deductible against capital gains tax uh, when you eventually come to dispose of the property. Um, sometimes this is forgotten because when you're buying it, you're not often thinking about what you're going to do um, on sale because that's often a few years in the future. But um, it's worth keeping in mind and keeping adequate records based on that. Um, now, at the the other end of the life cycle, um, when you come to selling or disposing a pro disposing of a property. Um, capital gains tax and inheritance tax um, implications are um, both uh, potentially relevant. Um, what I've done here is uh, given some information about the types of reliefs which are available uh, when it comes to the capital gains tax regime. Um, and these are particularly relevant when it comes to disposing of a residential property. Um, just for background, capital gains tax is a tax that's levied um, whenever you make a gain on a capital asset, and um, residential properties will generally always fall into that regime. Um, the first relief here, which I've described, is uh, what's known as principal private residence relief. Uh, you'll often hear it abbreviated to PPR relief. Um, 
it's applicable whenever you dispose of um, a main dwelling and main dwelling is defined based on the quality of your occupancy um, you can only have one main dwelling at any one point in time and the way the relief operates is that um, it looks to exempt a proportion of your gain uh, and that proportion is defined by that expression that you see there. Um, so the numerator is a uh, aggregation of the total length of actual occupancy and deemed occupancy uh, divided by your total ownership period. Um, so if if you live in a property for the entire duration of your ownership, then you tend to escape capital gains tax completely. But where you've only had partial occupancy, um, then you may only be eligible for partial PPR relief. Um, and then one of the questions which gets asked at that point is if I've only occupied the property for um, a pro uh, fraction of my ownership period, um, what other options are there available uh, in terms of relief? Um, and there's two answers to that. One is that capital gains, um, the, the PPR relief might still be relevant um, because there's a part of the legislation which allows you to say that you're deemed to have occupied the property even if you weren't actually occupying it. Um, and here are some examples of situations where you might be able to apply that um, deemed occupancy um, consideration. Um, so it applies when you're unable to occupy the property in the first 12 months of ownership. Uh, let's say you need to spend some time restoring it or renovating it. Um, also, if you're required to work away from home, so if your employer sends you abroad or um, too far away from um, a reasonable commuting distance, then you can claim up to four years of deemed occupancy. Um, in addition, there's also up to three years for any other absence, um, provided you reoccupy the property after those three years. Um, and now the final nine months of ownership are um, deemed, uh, are given as deemed occupancy. Um, that used to be 18 months, uh, it used to be three years before that, but the legislation is becoming tighter and tighter on that. Um, and secondly, lettings relief is also available. Um, so if you purchased a property, moved in, and then later moved out and um, let it out to tenants, um, a certain part of the gain might be exempt under lettings relief. Um, lettings relief uh, is delivered in a similar way to the PPR relief. And it's calculated as the lowest of these three factors, which you see listed here. Um, first one being the PPR relief already calculated on your ownership period. Um, the second factor being a limit of £40,000. And the third factor being the total gain that you made when you disposed of the property. Um, there's a few things to be aware of when CGT becomes relevant. Um, it's not applicable on transfers following death. So um, generally, the question that people ask is, um, on death, um, are both the regimes relevant? Uh, the answer is that capital gains becomes uh, not applicable, but IHT does become relevant. Um, it's also applicable on sale or gifts to people other than your spouse or a civil partner or a charity and for example if you're gifting a property down to um, children or grandchildren um, even if it's a full gift with no money being paid um, for capital gains tax purposes you're deemed to have made a sale at market value um, often if you've already lived in it um, PPR relief will exempt you for that gain the gain is still reportable, even if uh, no money is ultimately due. Um, the gains are only chargeable on, um, uh, sorry, the tax is only chargeable on gains where it exceeds your annual exemption. Um, currently, that's in the region of £12,000. Um, and deductible costs um, against capital gains tax are any capital enhancements that you made dur during your ownership period. So if you built an extension or um, improved the property in a, in a material way, 
Um, and also, um, one of the other things that sometimes gets forgotten is uh, legal and advisory fees that you have um, incurred on sale of the property. So, for example, um, fees that you incur from um, a, a real estate agent or from solicitors are also deductible. Um, one point to note is that um, up until um, 2015, non-residents used to be treat, um, used to be exempt from capital gains tax. Uh, but since 2015, there, there is legislation that brings them within the re regime as well. Um, and the um, tax rates applicable to non-residents are actually um, fairly uh, complex. So I haven't gone into any detail about that, but um, if anyone has any questions on that, they can raise that later. Um, and the table at the bottom is to um, show you what capital gains tax are applied to the gain. Um, depending on whether it's a residential property or a non-residential property and whether you're a basic rate or a higher rate payer. Um, your basic or higher rate is determined based on the level of other income that you have during the tax year. So if you have employment income um, that makes you a 40% income taxpayer, then you automatically um, fall into the higher rate regime for capital gains tax. And so you'd pay 28% on any gain that's not exempt from the reliefs that were described earlier. Um, and finally, I'm going to give some information about inheritance tax. Um, what, um, the background behind inheritance tax is that um, it becomes relevant um, on death. Um, there are situations where inheritance tax is also um, levied during life, um, but that tends to be when you're putting in place discretionary trusts. Um, so I'm not going to go into that detail here and now. Um, but generally, whenever it's a death tax that's levied whenever the donor dies um, within seven years of making a gift. And the way the uh, regime operates is it seeks to tax 40% of the value of the estate to the extent that it exceeds the nil rate band. Um, currently, the nil rate band available to uh, any individual is £325,000. Um, often you hear the figure of £650,000 um, being thrown into discussions. Um, that arises whenever um, you have a transfer on death to a spouse or a civil partner and then on, on subsequent death of the second um, partner the two nil rate bands accumulate and that's how you end up with um, 650,000 pounds being exempt um, and for specifically for your main home if your main home is part of your estate the nil rate band um, is increased to 500,000 pounds um, but just a, a word uh, or a caveat is that nil rate band of £500,000 um, is only relevant for transfers on death. Um, it's not applicable when you make a lifetime gift um, before death. Um, and finally, I thought it's worth um, giving everyone some guidance on a part of the legislation which is known as gift with reservation of benefit provisions. Um, it's it's a quite a long term, but what it means is if you were to gift the property that you currently live in to um, descendants or children or grandchildren, but you continue to live in that property um, while they become the owner, you're deemed to have been uh, you're deemed to have given the gift, but you're reserving the benefit of the gift. And for inheritance tax purposes. Um, the tax authority will generally say, although legally the title would have transferred to your descendants, uh, we're going to deem you to still own the property on death if you carried on living in it until um, until you died. Um, there are exceptions available um, where the uh, reservation of benefit provisions don't apply, and that tends to be when the donor needs to carry on living in the property for health reasons and where the donee is the carer. Um, and also, um, it, it 
can be exempt when the donor pays um, fair market value rent to the donee um, once trans once ownership has been transferred. Um, but a word of warning there is if you look to do that, um, that creates separate income tax implications. Um, so you should always look for advice um, based on the specific scenario at the time. Um, so that's a general overview of the relevant tax implications when you buy or sell a residential property. Um, I think we can probably take some questions if if you're uh, okay. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Sahil. Um, that, that was great. I uh, just want to bring back, uh, yep, Rupal and Nick. Um, so um, we've obviously got quite a few questions come through. Uh, some of them are much more focused on buy-to-let investments. And because we have a buy to let uh, investment session at 11.30 onwards, but we'll save some of those questions for then. Um, so I just wanna focus on some residential oriented questions and a few of them questions have come through. Um, do income multiples change if you're willing to put in a 20% deposit? Um, uh, presumably, uh, Nick Rupel, you might be able to answer that. If somebody puts in a 20% deposit as opposed to 25, would it make a, a difference in no. the multiple? So so, so the way income multiples work is typically you look at what income you've got available. Um, and so let's say for arguments, 100,000, 100, you would then have uh, a times 4.75. So that would be your max borrowing. Now, that could be limited by any commitments you have in the background. Um, so the deposit doesn't really have much of an implication on it. Does that make sense? Yes, uh, th thank you. Um, so again, uh, if um, whoever's asked that question, if, if that's not clear, then um, please do put a comment in or uh, catch up offline. Um, we, we also have uh, questions where we're looking at uh, professional mortgages. Um, so somebody is asking about whether a six times salary is possible. Um, so presumably this is for professionals. I think Nick, you'd mentioned dentists and pharmacists, et cetera. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, unfortunately, six times income isn't quite there yet. Um, and I think that, I think that's a little bit far-fetched um, as it currently stands. Um, but what I would say is, is that um, if you wouldn't mind just getting in touch perhaps afterwards, and we can certainly touch base and explore um, what your max borrowing um, is, and we can take it from there. Yeah, I, I guess it's probably down to individual circumstances. Um, right. We also have another question, uh, <clears throat> which is um, uh, they have a res residential mortgage with consent to let for one year. Uh, would the lenders consider them as an experienced landlord or a first time landlord? Would that make a difference? So they would go down as experienced. Yeah. Um, because the property has been let for six months plus. Um, so if that particular individual is looking to remortgage now onto a buy to let as an interest only repayment, then we can certainly explore that option. So again, yeah, feel free to get in touch with myself or Rupal. And we can certainly assist you there. Okay, thank you. Um, we also have another question where I think somebody's got a property which is um, subject to cladding issues uh, um, and looking for to sell it. Um, would lenders be open uh, in light of the slight increase in the cladding fund yeah oh go on Rupal. do you want to answer this one or shall I um so at the moment um I, I think with the government announcements on supporting cladding I think the key thing that stops people from getting the lending they need is not having this EWS1 form yeah so so my understanding is that um there shouldn't be an issue as long as there's an EWS1 form but to get that form, um, the freeholder or, of that building or, or, or property needs to ensure that they've got they've actually sorted out the cladding issue. Yeah, and I, I would just like to say as well is that, yes, we all know that there is a huge issue when it comes to cladding, um, especially for the current homeowners, and it is preventing sales or even for purchases. Um, it is down to the management company to actually get the EWS1 form, as Rupal just mentioned. Um, but with the extra funding now in place, hopefully that funding will go directly to the management company and that bill won't be passed on to the sellers. Um, so the management company will be able to hopefully, fingers crossed, um, 
uh, sort the cladding issue out and then issue the EWS one form accordingly. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I think we've got one question, um, maybe Sal, you can help with. Um, for CGD, gifting a property asset, can you gift a percentage of the asset over several years to take advantage of the CGD uh, exemption threshold each year? Yeah, I can I can answer that. Uh, it's a it's a really good question. Um, the short answer is no. The long answer is potentially yes. Um, what you have to be aware of is that there's anti avoidance legislation built into the capital gains regime. Uh, so, for example, if I owned a property worth half a million pounds and I tried to um, gift five percent of it to my um, um, whoever the beneficiaries are every year, just to gift £12,000 worth to them. Um, it tends to get caught by anti-avoidance legislation, which um, treats it as a connected transaction. Um, so where you've created an artificial structure to um, look like it's a series of transactions, the tax authority will say that's actually all one transaction for capital gains tax purposes. Yeah, uh, no, thank, uh, thank you for that. And also, is, is my understanding correct that, for example, if a parent was to gift it to a child, but they didn't still reside in the same property, then it's not technically a gift and they would be actually liable for rent. Um, so is, is that correct? Um, so um, it, it depends. Um, so what, what happens is they're either liable for rent or they're liable for inheritance tax, and it's trying to gauge a trade-off between the two. Yeah. Yeah. No, th th thank you for that. Um, again, as I mentioned, there's quite a few questions relating to buy to lets. We will cover them in the next uh, session. And I think, Sail, you're going to be around for that as well. Uh, and I think Rupal and Nick are also going to be on hand uh, for the buy to let session at 11.30. Um, for the residential session, I do want to say a big thank you to Nick and Rupal from London Mortgage Solutions for your insights and for helping us out today. Uh, as well as Sahil uh, for your tax uh, advice and consideration. Thank you so much, uh, guys, for taking part in this today.